Hi, welcome to the next in our series of Practical Electromagnetics for Engineers. We're going to do another review today, and we're going to review the relation of complex numbers to waves. It turns out that we studied complex numbers because we need them to understand waves. So let's go ahead and take a look at uh, this, this representation of a complex number. We have a real part and an imaginary part here. And we know we can also represent this in terms of a magnitude and a phase, or instead of this horrible cosine sine notation, we often write it as a magnitude e to the i phase, and theta here is the term we use for phase. And, and this is pretty straightforward, and you probably know this already, that theta, the phase, is the angle it makes between the real axis and this line. The length of the line is m, the magnitude of it. And so we can represent any complex number um, by a magnitude and a phase, just we can, as we can represent it by the real part plus the imaginary part. The reason this magnitude and phase notation becomes useful, however, is as follows. Let's get rid of that um, and now put the a line of magnitude m along the real axis. In this case, we know phase is zero because there's no angle. But what happens if we let theta, the phase, vary? Um, here it goes. It goes around in a circle. I apologize for the crummy animation. This computer's a little bit slow. But we've taken two rotations around. So we've let theta vary um, first all the way around from zero to 360 degrees is our first rotation. And then another 360 degrees to 720 degrees takes us to our second rotation. If we remember that this rotation is 360 degrees, and we can also represent this as 2 pi radians, and we're going to be using radians rather than degrees because that's the way it's almost always done, um, we can plot this out as a function of phase. So phase here is on our, our x-axis. Um, if we plot the real part, you can see that when theta is equal to zero, or the phase is zero at its, its maximum, and we'd expect the imaginary component at this point to be zero, and that's what it is. And you essentially get the real and the imaginary part varying like this. These are obviously waves. They're sinusoidal waves. The real and imaginary parts are 90 degrees, um, or pi over 2 radians out of phase, just because the real and imaginary axes are separated by 90 degrees. Um, we know that the magnitude, or m, is essentially the height of that wave. <clears throat> and so this relation is why we, we use complex numbers to describe waves. The phase, it turns out, represents where you are on the periodic signal of the wave, and the amplitude are the maximum and minimum values of that wave. And waves in this course are going to vary in both time and space, and this variation determines the phase of the wave. Um, let's take a look at this. So here we've plotted the real and imaginary parts as a function of theta or phase, and we know our magnitude because that's the amplitude. <coughs> it turns out that if the wave varies as time, we simply write theta as being equal to omega, that's a radial frequency, two times, two pi times the real frequency, f you're used to, and that variation ju then just goes as e to the i omega t, and when omega t is equal to two pi, the wave has gone from this point to this point, or one rotation around that argand diagram, or one period of the wave. Um, similarly, we can represent signals in space that vary with theta equal equaling kz, where k is something called the wave vector, we'll learn a little bit later, and z is where we are on the wave, and we have exactly the same notation um, for phase here. The time to go through one cycle is called the period for thinking about waves in time, and the number of cycles per second is called the frequency f, and here's the relationship between the frequency you might read on an oscilloscope and the radial frequency. You just take that frequency you read and multiply it by 2 pi. Um, similarly, the distance it takes for the wave to go through one cycle is called the wavelength. Uh, we use the Greek letter lambda for that, and that's measured in meters. So one wavelength might be from this point on the wave to this point on the wave. And so let's write that on so we have a pretty clear notation of what that is. And it turns out that k, which is called the wave vector, which goes into the phase, is 2 pi over the wavelength, uh, just like we know that um, the frequency, omega, is equal to 2 pi over the period, t. Now, it's important to note that we often talk about waves as if they have a certain frequency or a certain wavelength, but waves really mathematically are defined in terms of amplitude and phase, and it turns out there's a relationship 
um, of the phase with time. For example, the rate of change of the phase in time, d phase dt, uh, if we plug that in, turns out to be the frequency. Similarly, the definition of wave vector is the rate of change of the phase with distance. Now, phase can be a little bit confusing sometimes because many times when you talk about the phase, you're talking about an extra term you add on. An, uh, we'll call it here a phi. And you say, oh, the, this is the phase of the wave. And, and that's not actually correct. This phi is, does something, but the real phase of the wave is everything here. That's the phase. This extra phi is added to shift the wave. So if I'm, I'm going to make phi increase and then decrease again. And you'll see what happens to the wave. It actually shifts as I go to different values of phase, back and forth. And so this extra phase is added to move waves in time or to move waves in space. Now, it turns out there's not a conservation law for amplitude. Um, a lot of times we think if we add two waves together, and let's say each of these waves have an amplitude of 2, then we're going to get a bigger wave with an amplitude of 4, because 2 plus 2 equals 4, and that's conservation. Um, it turns out that that's not the case, because you can take two waves, each with an amplitude of 2, but if the waves are 180 degrees out of phase with each other, as they are here, they'll add pretty much to 0. And so this obviously is not a wave of amplitude 4. And that's very important to remember, that there's a conservation law for mass, because if you add two of the same masses together, you get twice the mass. There is for energy, there is for power, but there's not a conservation law 